Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and uh, uh, thank you also for having me. That's a great honor. And to be very frank, I prefer to have been with you because I've never been in Slot Lufestein and I've read the stories about uh, Hugo de Groot. Uh, and also I had prepared a speech uh, in talking to the organizers yesterday, but listening to the last part of the previous speaker, uh, so many different thoughts came to my mind. So I'm going to try to give you uh, a practitioner's uh, view, somebody who works closely with Mr. Timmermans and Diederik Samson and, and a small team here, and, and then we'll, we'll see where we end up. So bear with me. Uh, first of all, being in Stolp-Lufestein virtually uh, 400 years uh, after, it is interesting. I like to say that the Netherlands uh, has a geopolitical interest, a strategic interest for centuries, which basically is uh, keep people out of our country and allow us to trade freely. Um, so that the, the, the rules of the sea, the law of the sea uh, that uh, uh, Mr. de Groot uh, uh, put in place or, or established um, was, of course, a moral feat, but I also thought it was a very functional feat for a small trading nation. Uh, and the importance of an international order uh, for security and prosperity is something that, for instance, I think is the basis of the European uh, Union, first the communities and then the European Union, uh, established on the ash heaps of the Second World War, uh, where they thought, OK, we need to get rid of ideologies and politics, so let's base this on common rules. Uh, and here we are uh, uh, today. And, and I mention it because um, while I, I fully concur with uh, um, the right reasonings and uh, why of fairness uh, and of our future, of the health and well-being of, of, of us and our children and grandchildren and the role that courts play, uh, one could also pose a question if it's not disconcerting that courts actually have to play a role and what that means for the role of governments and their capacity and competence and the trust in governments. And I, I, I have a, a slight worry uh, uh, there. Um, but getting back to uh, uh, what we're doing here and trying to do is to say, OK, uh, you know, we've known since the Lorax and even before that uh, our planet is burning and we're, we're burning it uh, for her, that we need to change. And so in 2019, when uh, Franz Timmermans started to run uh, to become president of the next European Commission, uh, he always came back with stories that everywhere I go and everywhere I speak to people, it resonates when I speak about nature, when I speak about pollution, when I speak about climate change. And uh, so his platform grew and grew, and uh, he did rather well in the Dutch, uh, uh, in the Dutch part of the elections uh, and ultimately became the executive vice president for the Green Deal. And the new president of the Commission, von der Leyen, uh, uh, internalized uh, uh, and embraced uh, the Green Deal in her political guidelines, got support of the European Parliament. And before this new commission was put into place already behind the scenes uh, uh, with uh, under the leadership also of Diederik Samson, we were working real hard to lay out the Green Deal, the map and compass for the next years, what we were going to do. So as soon as this commission went through Parliament, we, we bolted out of the stable with the Green Deal, while a lot of people were still looking for their emails and, and, and offices here in the commission building. Uh, um, maybe not everyone knew exactly what they signed up to, but we got it through. And it was transformative because I don't think anywhere in the world there is such a comprehensive approach uh, from agriculture, uh, from industry, from energy, from a built environment to mobility, to taxonomy, uh, to trade. All of these things were put in there. And we knew one thing. We knew that the, 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 the legitimacy of doing that in the public eye was high. If you look at all the opinion polls on an abstract level, 93 percent, these high percentages of people, let's say 80, but it was 93. Uh, um, so even if there are margins, said you need to do something about climate. But we also knew that uh, the window of opportunity could close very quickly. So when we uh, had agreed and the European leaders uh, of the, the EU member states had agreed to set climate neutrality in 2050 as a goal, uh, we said we need to put that in a climate law, which is our political navigator, our political tom tom. And three days after we put that proposal on the table, uh, COVID broke out. And that was one of those events where we thought, uh, well, first of all, uh, we didn't know what havoc this would wreak amongst our people and around the world. 
Uh, but secondly, we also, of course, were very fearful that this would mean everything's off the table. And, and some of you may remember 2008. I don't like PowerPoint, but the best PowerPoint ever given by Vice President Al Gore uh, called The Inconvenient Truth on the basis of his book. It was a great PowerPoint. And for a couple of months, everyone spoke about climate change. And then Lehman Brothers fell uh, and nobody spoke about it again. And so we were worried about that. But the interesting thing in hindsight is if you look back, uh, if anything, this COVID pandemic has accelerated the transition. Because to their credit, the European leaders understood as they are unlocking 2 trillion euros worth of money for recovery and building back better, they understood that they can only spend this money once. So they wanted to spend it right from the get-go. So they embedded in the DNA of our recovery and our future policies, the twin pillars of the green transition and the digital transformation. These are now the two twin pillars on, upon which everything is based. And then the leaders decided in December 2020 uh, so a year after the Green Deal, that not only do we have climate neutrality in, in 2050, but to get there, we need to up our ambition of minus 40% in 2030 to minus 55%. And so that gave us the green light to work really, really hard on a legislative package called Fit for 55. And that is not a fitness program for, for people uh, my age. Uh, that is Fit for 55, 13 legislative proposals uh, to, to increase and, and actually put the policies in place to increase our ambition and get there. And that, too, is very transformative. And even before the proposals hit the table, it had effect in political markets around the world and in economic markets around the world. And I'm not going to go into detail. You can read all about it. But it's part is, of course, the backbone of our climate policy is the cap and trade, the emissions trading system, which is already very, very functional. Uh, and at the same uh, uh, time, uh, increasing our standards uh, uh, for all kinds of products, going for zero emission vehicles in 2035, rolling out uh, electrical infrastructure, uh, innovating in alternative fuels, phasing out free allowances for aviation, uh, creating a taxonomy, uh, cleaning up our biodiversity, uh, and uh, last but not least, or not last because it's where we're, there's more to come, but a carbon border adjustment tax, which basically says uh, we cannot green our whole industry and society back home only to see all the industry to move away and start producing uh, uh, dirty elsewhere, which is carbon leakage. And we say to the Americans and the Russians and the Chinese, any country that goes through a transition has to deal with a carbon leakage. So that was the fit for 55. And meanwhile, at the same time, as we started, we were reaching out to the Chinese because we knew there's going to be a COP26 uh, in Glasgow. We didn't know when that was postponed because of COVID, but we needed to, to reach out to the big major emitters uh, to start our climate uh, diplomacy. So we started up with the Chinese. That, that, that was a long slog to, to, to get the trust and get the dialogue going and get the, to know the people, but that went well. And then, of course, when the Biden administration won, uh, a day after the inauguration, uh, John Kerry formally, because they'd been speaking before, because they know each other, uh, we had a, a video conference with both teams and, and kind of set up a very close coordination unit uh, so that we could move forward and and and, and push other emitters to, uh, to come up with better uh, targets for COP26 in Glasgow, which we had uh, two weeks ago, a week ago. Now, to turn to COP, it's what's helpful when you look at COP, what were the three main targets? The first target was we needed to increase the ambition of cutting emissions around the world so that we could say we fulfill the Paris uh, commitments to stay well below two degrees Celsius close to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if you add up all the cuts of emissions around the world, that would be your goal, to get as low as you can uh, under two degrees. And every point something percent has a huge impact. So this is really not uh, uh, just statistical uh, uh, magic. Um, and as we move forward, we saw some progress. Some countries came out with new net zero uh, targets in 250, 260, sometimes 270. Uh, some national determined contributions were increased. So there was a momentum growing there. And while we went into COP, where they where the OECD issued a report saying, well, we're at two point, I think it was 2.7 degrees, which is too high. When we came out of the COP, uh, the International Energy Agency said, well, we're at 1.8 degrees. Now, of course, 
uh, one has to see how the deliverance uh, comes, but the fact that there was momentum was good. So that's a success uh, and we have to move forward. The second pillar was about climate finance. The developed world promised all the poor nations, we're going to pay you annually a $100 billion together so that you can adapt uh, and mitigate uh, on climate change, because basically it's not your fault, it's our fault, and we need to pay you. Now, with the Americans leaving uh, the stage uh, during the previous administration, there was a huge gap of around $20 billion in that climate finance, and that was being of course, uh, questioning our commitment, our credibility by the, the most vulnerable states, and that was going to be a huge problem. So we worked real hard with all partners to increase that amount, getting as close to 100 billion and possibly going through the roof of 100 billion in 2023. There too, we are very, we came very close. We're closing in. We haven't reached it yet, but after 2023, we're going to go up, and that will be the minimum basis for the years to come. So while not 100% success, great momentum. And I'd like to think that uh, we and the Americans said so much, we helped them by, because the EU is already taking a third of that money and we added some 4 billion and that helped the Americans come forward a little bit more as well. And the third thing was the rule book of Paris. And it's, it's incredibly technical, but it's also incredibly important to make sure that the, the, the carbon markets in the world and the whole system of checking each other's commitments and implementation is actually transparent, is verifiable, is uh, comparable. So the rule book on accounting and transparency uh, was finally closed uh, and completed. So that was a success. So... Uh, I don't know what you read in the papers, but having been there, having seen uh, the mayhem, the circus of global diplomacy, because there were thousands and thousands of people all over the place in many, many pavilions pushing their interests and ultimately coming to a convergence on world scale for me is a big seven, close to eight. And uh, uh, of course, I would say so because I work for, the, uh, for Europe and for my boss, but uh, the role of the EU here as a bridge builder was very instrumental. And, uh, and, and I'm really proud of that, actually, that, that uh, my boss and, and the team could play that role. So that's COP. And now we're looking forward to this Fit for 55 package, which we gave to the member states and European Parliament, because that still has to be negotiated and come through. Uh, and we're looking forward to the next COP in Cairo, Egypt, next year. So we need to continue all those uh, diplomatic outreach we have with, with the, Ch the, the Chinese, the Russians, uh, uh, the Turks, the Saudis, the South Africans, uh, and, and of course the Americans. Um, and the interesting thing was in all these discussions so far, we have managed to maintain that the existential challenge of uh, uh, climate change and ecocide uh, uh, oversends, transcends uh, politics. That is not a given. That can change because the world is, is in, a, in a huge flux at the moment. But that is what we're going to do. And then to, to finish... On the note, I'm just looking at the clock because then it allows for some questions and, and listening too long can be boring. Um, on the issue of what does this mean, coming back to what we said in the beginning about the rule of law and the rule by law and the international order. Because when I listened to the previous speaker, Mr. Groot, I, I, I sent that there is an increased uh, reference to courts. Uh, there's an increased push in the climate field for global action. But at the same time, we have to say that uh, since uh, the, the late 80s and the past decades, we see a, a, a steady erosion of the international global order when it comes to uh, how the OECE functions, how the WTO functions, um, the attacks on that, how the international treaties on security, nuclear security, SALT, New START, have, uh, ABM, uh, INF have been uh, broken down between major powers um, the, the go it alone spirit that has happened. I mean, in the last four years were cold years in terms of uh, the transatlantic relationship showing us that nothing is irreversible and nothing is unthinkable. So that is a problem because that runs counter to what we need, namely uh, a global governance system, uh, because everything we do in COP, mind you, is voluntary. 
uh, and and we will not have a global government, so it will remain a uh, 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 voluntary. But we need to maintain that. And part of that also is the notion, as my boss likes to say, you know, why do we do all this? We don't do this for the well-being of the planet per se. The planet has been here for more than three and a half billion years without human beings, uh, and if she gets rid of us, she'll be fine for the next uh, four or five billion years. We do this ultimately for the health and well-being and prosperity of all people, uh, not now, but also today, our children and, and, and grandchildren, hence also uh, Franz Timmermans, who showed case uh, um, uh, to, to the people to show this is what we're doing it for. And so when we come to, and this is about humans, and this is about rights, and in a sense, it's also about human rights, and we have law for that, but it's incomplete and it's suboptimal. So I can tell you now that we are looking in the commission uh, at an environmental crime uh, directive to update that uh, and to adapt it to everything that happened in, in the past two decades. Uh, we're also following very closely the ecocide discussion. Uh, we were with Philippe Sands, I'm sure uh, many of you know him, in London to have a debate with my boss and him, Paul Simmons and him on uh, the, the, the issue of ecocide, uh, how you can put that in the Rome statute. Uh, you will hear Franz Timmermans mention ecocide all the time, so we'll follow that legal uh, debate. We are going to bring out a sustainable corporate governance uh, legislation, I hope, before the end of the year, which is horizontal and deals with trade and liability. And in that, we will include uh, human rights. And I say this because just yesterday we brought out a uh, uh, new legislation, which I think is groundbreaking, a landmark legislation on deforestation, basically saying we EU market, EU citizens don't want to be part anymore of driving deforestation through our consumption of chocolate, coffee, uh, co uh, palm oil, soya, uh, beef and wood. Um, this is not going to be easy. We're going to get quite some flack, but it is an authentic reflection of how we want to change our ways. And obviously that also has to do with rights of indigenous people, which we have in that other legislation, which is coming out. So what I think to end on the note, uh, um, when Hugo Grotius uh, fled Slot Lufestein, and my history is, is a bit iffy compared to you, uh, but I think he was breaking uh, the law. But he was not breaking the rule of law. I think he was breaking the rule by law. As Mr. Groot said, it was not fair. And this we see in, in the EU today as well. Uh, the rule of law is what holds us together. It is the bedrock of everything. Not only do we think it is an answer to the question, who are we, as we put down in Article 2 of our Treaty of the European Union, not only is it an answer to uh, uh, so not only a moral issue of virtue, but it is also a functional issue because without the rule of law, the EU cannot function. There will be no trust between traders, investors for the internal market. There will be no trust between uh, judicial systems to exchange information, to fight crime or to fight terrorism. And there will be no credibility for our, our external policy, our EU foreign policy, if we can't get it right. And so on the one hand, it is concerning that we have to deal with these issues within the EU, but it's also a wake up call that nothing can be taken for granted. Nothing is irreversible, also not democracy or the rule of law. On the other hand, it is good that we have the ability to discuss these things, to have some cathartic uh, capacity in the EU. And we're not there yet, uh, but I wanted to end uh, this talk on that note uh, and try to link these two uh, together because for a green transition, it has to be solidarity, otherwise there will be no uh, green transition. But to have a true green transition, we also need the rule of law. So thank you for that. I hope I, I hope I haven't done too much and uh, thrown too much on the table. But uh, let's see what the questions are. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Tony. You were actually uh, way ahead of your time. I'm actually looking at the screen, so I'm, I'm not sure where you can see me or I should look in the camera, but um, bear with me on that. You see me? <laughs> Excellent. Um, I think your agenda is quite progressive and um, you're actually pushing for many new ideas, progressive ideas. Uh, you also mentioned ecocide, which is very much linked also to future generations, crimes against humanity, uh, crimes against the earth. 
Another thing that really has popped up in the European Parliament is a focus or more focus on the rights of nature. So safeguarding the rights of future generations by also giving rights to nature, to rivers, to forests. Jan Terlau actually pleaded for that last night as well, give rights to nature. A very interesting program that we might work on with Slot Louvestein next year as well. Could you elaborate on that as well? So do you see that as well in your new agenda? And maybe, uh, and, and a sub-question, and then I'll give the, 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 the room to the floor, a sub-question. Do you see um, literally wording towards the rights of future generation come up in, in all those new proposals and those new documents as well? So will we see um, the interests of future generations and wording on future generations in future texts of the Commission? Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so there, there, there are more questions, but there, I, I dis, there's still two of them. So the first is the idea to, to give rights to uh, nature, rivers, trees, uh, and other or ecosystems. Um, when we were in London discussing with Philip Sands, uh, uh, Mr. Timmermans and Mr. Sands agreed on, on many things. Uh, but I think our approach is more Anthropocene in, in terms of we take the human uh, individual as our point of departure um, because, I don't know, now it becomes philosophical. If, if there's no human, there's no morality, perhaps. I don't know. And it could be even religious. But without... So, so that's the first part. And the second part is... The, the only way we can safeguard uh, humanity is also to continue to get the support by citizens uh, and by humanity for the proposals that we have. And as I said in the beginning, on an abstract level, there's a lot of support. But as soon as you delve in to say, but it means this, people say, well, you know, can you leave me alone with that? I mean, go, go to the other, let them do it. People don't like, you know, in the history of status quo, uh, status quo has never embraced change. Uh, and, and so we really need to, to maintain that support. And to get maintain that support, there are a number of things to do. And the first thing is to say, this is not only project fear, even though science as it evolves shows us uh, that it is very, very dire. It is not a joke. It's not just some rhetor rhetoric saying, you know, we only have 10 years. Actually, every year counts at the moment. It's unfortunate, but as always, the urgent pushes out the important until the important also uh, becomes urgent. And that's where we are now. So, but it's not just about project fear. It's also about a positive proposition to people. What does it mean for them? And in our proposition is we're not telling you to munch on grass or go live in cold caves. We're saying, you know, if you make a change of life, you can be healthier. If we can have less pesticides in our uh, foods, uh, crops, that's healthier. If we can lower the air pollution in our inner cities, because right now in Europe, 400,000 people per year die prematurely because of air pollution. Somehow we found that's normal. Well, we don't think it's normal. Forget about the babies and asthma that don't die. Um, we can uh, have more trees in the cities for cooler cities. We can have more parks where people can go out. Sorry, somebody's calling me to say no. Um, so it's a positive proposition. And mind you, we think we're, our Green Deal, we call, is our growth strategy. Because we think that the new economy is more, not only more sustainable in its use of resources and, and, and protecting the environment, but also more sustainable in the long run. Uh, we are still at the, well, we think at the end of a fossil fueled economy of almost 150, 200 years old, which is sputtering, which is going all over the place. And you can still grow a little bit, but in five to 10 years time, if you still invest in it, you'll be left with stranded assets. So we also think it's a growth strategy. So it's a positive proposition. If we would, however, say it's only going to cost you, the benefits are not for you, but they're just for nature, uh, I don't think that's a good proposition. So that's more of a political uh, statement. Now, your question is, will we see in the commission documents um, the reference to future generations? Well, you can be darn sure that in almost every speech that Franz Timmermans uh, uh, holds, 
uh, and as I just now did uh, a little bit in his name, we always mention this because frankly speaking, I will be fine. And I think most of you in the room, you'll probably be fine. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're prosperous enough to, to secure ourselves, to get medication, uh, vaccines, uh, to, to live in a house which is well insulated and, and we'll bear it. But what about my kid? I've got four kids. They're all teenagers. Uh, the eldest two are studying. Their future looks very different. And they're the ones coming at home. And frankly speaking, for the first time, I think in a long time, you see a young generation going, taking the streets and organizing itself. And we like to think that without Fit for Friday for Future marches uh, by Greta Thunberg, there would not have been a Green Deal. And a lot of CEOs of car companies or other industry that we meet, because we also meet with them, we have to meet with, with all of them. They say, yes, my daughter, or yes, my son told me this. So that, uh, that future generation is leaving already a huge imprint, and rightfully so, because the debts that we're making today will be on their shoulders. So the investments we make should be for them. Thank you, Tony. I think you're very much aware of the interests and the rights of future generations, and you'll be looking forward to the Maastricht principles on human rights and future generations when it comes out. We will make sure to get it sent to you. I have a question here. Can we have a microphone? Please wait until you ask the question until you have the microphone, because then all the people on Zoom can hear it as well. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first question is, I hear you talk about net zero. Um, but if I understood correctly, net zero is based on technologies that don't exist yet. So to me, it sounds like an empty promise because it's not concrete. And the other question I have is about the rights of nature because uh, the ecosystem and the earth, it's all integrated and our life also depends on how the nature is doing. So how can you not take that all together? Yes, well, very pertinent uh, uh, and good questions. So when it comes to net zero, obviously a part of it, uh, and we don't know, but technology will advance and, 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 and that's always unpredictable how it will advance. But it's, it, it, uh, believe me that the whole net zero uh, at targets is not based merely on technology. And if you look at our Fit for 55 proposal, as I said, so the backbone is, for instance, the emission trade system. What we're proposing there, so mind you, since, what, 16 years, the industry, the energy industry that was covered by the ETS lowered its emissions by 42.6%, right? Uh, that is hugely successful, and that's a market mechanism. What we're proposing is to lower the ceiling of that uh, uh, tr trading cap system, to phase out allowances, uh, free allowances for aviation, and we're going to put uh, the going to have a separate ETS emission trade system for built environment and transport. So we're we're going to crunch crunch that. So that's very effective. Then we're going to uh, increase standards for all kinds of products, whether, uh, whether it's in agriculture or whether it's in, um, uh, uh, in your household appliances, but also for cars, zero emissions. That's literally, that's what we're asking member states to do to, to strengthen those standards so that their energy efficiency will increase tremendously. Then we're going to work at new uh, alternative fuels. Those technologies are already here. The technology, even the technology for hydrogen, for green hydrogen is here. What is not here is a market that can provide green hydrogen at scale. So that is what we're, work, we're going to work uh, towards too. Fourth, uh, um, the fourth generation of, of uh, 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 nuclear um, nuclear installations is already here. The increasing of our natural sinks and our forests, that's not new technology. That's a political commitment and that we're going to put in law to plant trees to increase the, the, uh, the quality of forests so that the sinks and the carbon capture is there. Carbon capture, a technology that exists and that will be, uh, for instance, in Rotterdam, could be used really well. So there's, there's a plethora of existing technology technologies uh, that need to uh, be applied, be brought to, uh, uh, brought to the market, or simply because we say that's how you have to do it. If you get a cruise ship in Rotterdam, next time don't use their own diesel generators to, 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 for their power, but then use electricity they get from, uh, from the land. 
Um, so there, there, there's just a whole lot. So I, I really would uh, uh, plead to, to not believe that it's all uh, based on a, on a cloud because or hot air, if I may use that word. Uh, that's not that's not true. Then uh, with rights to nature. Now you're fully right. Everything is connected, and and you can say that we are uh, as humans are an animal with with a with a suit. We are nature uh, as well. Um, what I've wanted to say is I. I it's, it's, it's a very interesting uh, topic, but in the political reality right now, our fight is to continue to maintain the public support of what we're doing. And at the moment, we still have it. And that's why it's hugely important that the Americans, President Biden, is going to get back not only his infrastructure bill, but also his Build Back Better bill with climate uh, policies. Uh, it's extremely important that China has its so-called N plus one policy, because we say China needs to do more. But and that's true. But they're still putting some in place because because they're doing it. It allows us to continue to to be a trailblazer, because, of course, the, the other side is if we don't have support and there are always people that say, you know what, why should we do it? Either it's too late. So forget about it. It's too costly. And hey, we're only eight percent of the world's emissions. So let's just stop all this nonsense. You can hear this, especially now when uh, the gas prices are going up, which has nothing to do with the green transition, but everything to do with the recovery after COVID. So that's the political reality that I just wanted to illustrate that we work in. Uh, and believe me, we're just doing everything we can to make sure that we, we move the needle, we set in a course, uh, and we stay that course. Uh, that's what I wanted to say. That doesn't mean we cannot have discussions on on rights for 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 nature. But frankly speaking, uh, I, I would be happy to double check. But I don't think this is something that we as a commission uh, now have put in. But again, I, I I'd like to say a uh, repeat. Uh, we are going to update our environmental crime directive. And part of that update is not just taking into account developments that have happened since uh, a couple of decades, but we're also very closely following this ecocide debate internationally. And that perhaps could be an opening for something that perhaps you would like a little bit more. But I just wanted to illustrate the tensions that uh, we have to fight in between, you know, what is ideal and, and what we can ultimately achieve. I hope I hope that answers your question satisfactorily. Thank you. I think we see this. I also think we see the struggle, and I also think we see you need political backup, also locally, to support things like rights of nature. Uh, thankfully, uh, Frans Timmermans has already spoken out uh, for a, a campaign that is out there for rights of the River Meuse, the uh, Rechte van de Maas, the Maas in the Wet, and he supported the rights of nature for the Maas. So I guess we just need mayors in the district of the Maas River to also stand up, and, and city councils, and then it can be pushed all the way through Europe. I think you need that backup locally. Thank you for that. Another question from the room, Simone. Hi, Tony. This is uh, Simone Filippini uh, speaking here. Good to see you. And uh, thanks for your, for your talk and the passion you display. Well, let's hope that the uh, European Union will really develop into a leader. I had a question because... Uh, yeah, OK. Uh, well, practice and theory sometimes are a little bit... Um, uh, diverse, uh, but di diverging. Uh, so, but what we also need to um, to take care of is not to just put band aid and uh, um, and see to adaptations or feed into the consequences. But what I was thinking is that, you know, if you look at the alternatives in terms of energy, etc., resource use is still there. So we, we need to get to circularity. And if I look at, for example, a simple thing like Afghanistan has large lithium uh, resources. The Chinese are already uh, vying for influence there. You know, the, uh, the water scarcity in the Middle East and North Africa and the Gulf region and other places, resources are key. So. Um, it, does the European Union, for example, have a policy on displaying the true price of products and processes? Because as consumers, but also as, as for example, governments uh, have to make tough choices, they need to know what the real facts are. And we just don't know. 
is our electric cars so much better than other cars? I mean, what are true solutions? Not the band-aid ones, but true solutions. How to get to true circularity? Because I haven't really heard you talking about that. And that is key for a, a, a healthy future of, of us, mankind, and the planet. Oh, and taxation, please. Taxation of bad behavior. Can you come up with that one? <laughs> Long question, and we need a short answer, Tony. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. Very quickly. First of all, I fully disagree that what we're doing is a band-aid. What we're doing is a transformational, and I challenge anyone in the world to find any other continent that has an uh, as an ambitious project as we do or as comprehensive. Because I fully agree, this is not a band-aid. It has to be a comprehensive approach, not just one or the other thing. Then on circular, you're absolutely right. I should have mentioned it. It is part and parcel of everything we do to cut the resources resource use from our growth. And we've already proven that if, since 1990, I think we've been able to, to cut our uh, uh, emissions by 62% and still grow. So this is possible. Circularity is uh, uh, embedded in everything we do. We want to go to circularity and change everything from design, consumption, waste, uh, everything we do has to be uh, circular. So you're absolutely right. But there are dilemmas. So you mentioned, uh, and the previous uh, uh, speaker asked about, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, about when you, you mentioned lithium, Afghanistan, and you mentioned about um, the, the right price and the transition. To make a True transition, yeah, you know, you know, the previous speaker uh, and uh, spoke about technologies, and that's, that's what I wanted to get to. To have these transition technologies, unfortunately, we need a lot of rare earths. Uh, they are currently mostly mined in China because a lot of these mines were closed. To mine these minerals is not very environmental friendly, to put it lightly. And for instance, we just released an Arctic strategy uh, where we had a big fight on the end. We, we said in the new Arctic, which we see that uh, because of the climate change, you, you open up shipping lanes and there are countries, Arctic countries, who want to exploit it. They want to exploit travel. They want to exploit uh, the minerals in uh, in there, and especially the fossil fuels. What we managed to get in that Arctic strategy was to, to push for a global moratorium on fossil fuels. Just don't dr uh, drill in them, let alone burn what you find, and don't explore more because we don't need it, we can't use it because then we're over tipping points. We didn't manage to get that on minerals because we need those minerals for the transition, especially in, 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 in the in-between time. Afghanistan, uh, obviously, uh, we know, I think it has also cobalt, has a, a, a lot of these uh, uh, resources. Of course, Afghanistan itself is, is, is fraught with uh, great political problems. Uh, who knows in the future whether we can combine these things and, and help the country uh, on its feet. Uh, but you also mentioned China, so there's also a geopolitical race there. So there are a lot of, like Isaiah Berlin said about freedom and, and, and equality, we want both, but they're opposite. And we will have these similar dilemmas in well. Then you spoke about tax taxation. So we have uh, an energy taxation where we want to make sure that the, is the, the price reflects is an honest one, as you say. So right now, aviation fuel, kerosene, is not taxed. So when you put gas in your car, you pay tax. If you take the train, you pay tax for electricity. But if you take the plane, uh, uh, there's no tax on that. That doesn't that doesn't represent a fair market. The price the prices are skewed because of that. So we're looking at that uh, as well. And uh, then, of course, there's a discussion of our taxonomy, which is kind of a guidance for, for investors. That's going to be a, a huge discussion also because member states have different approaches. Uh, um, I don't think that's, that's going to be the, the end of, of, of everything. But, uh, well, we're in the midst of that discussion. So let's see where that ends up. I tried to do it real fast because she deserves a, a good answer for a good question.